Hi, I'm Len Epp from LeanPub, and in this episode of the Front Matter Podcast, I'll be interviewing Philip Gannon. Based in Madrid, Philip has been working as a software engineer since 2010, with his experience primarily based in marketing automation SaaS platforms. He is accomplished in cross-functional team management, hiring, leadership, and mentoring for developers of all levels, as well as full-stack development, technical R&D, and system design. You can follow him on Twitter at SpeakingSW, that's Speaking Software, and check out his website at SpeakingSoftwareShow.com. Philip is the author of the Lean Pub book, Becoming a Senior, Become a Senior Developer, a concise guide to succeeding as a senior software developer. In the book, Philip walks you through what success looks like for the role of a senior developer and how you can upskill to get there. In this interview, we're going to talk about Philip's background and career, his professional interests, and his book or his books at even. Uh, and so thank you very much, Philip, for being on the Lean Pub Front Matter podcast. Oh, thanks for inviting me. Looking forward to it. I always like to start these interviews by asking people for their origin story. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about where you grew up and how you found your way into the world of software development. Sure, yeah. So um, I'm originally from Dublin, Ireland, from a small town called Swords. That's in the north of Dublin city. And uh, funnily enough, my dad was a builder, had no kind of computer background or whatever, no academic background. But one day he bought a secondhand 386. This is like when I was like seven years old. And he brought it home. We had no idea how it worked apart from just plugging it in and then through the magic of different magazines, uh, you know, shareware, floppy disks you'd get. And uh, a cousin of mine was really into computers. So we would stay up to like stupid o'clock in the morning for weeks on end trying to get it to do things. And eventually we got like Windows installed through like 30 different floppy disks and started programming in sense of like editing auto bat files to like manually change the IRQ to get like a Sound Blaster card to work and all this kind of stuff. So at the age of seven of eight, messing around with all that and then it just spiraled out of control from there like everybody else is putting like websites on GeoCities and started getting into DHTML as it was at the time that then became Ajax and then became the JavaScript we all know and love so by the time I hit my teens I was like playing around with that playing around with PHP MySQL that sort of stuff so when it came came time to like go to university it was a really obvious choice of just like computers it's it's got to be computers it's not going to be anything else um, and then it all just kind of ran off from there. Yeah, thanks very much for for sharing that. That's really great. I mean, I've heard I've heard so many uh, versions of that uh, kind of story on the podcast over the years because so many Lingo authors are into computers and stuff like that. And it's it's so interesting how we we date ourselves um, uh, with the way the way we learned about these kinds of things and how. And a lot of the stories are a parent brought a computer into the home, and the person just like really enjoyed being able to make it do things or get okay. sorry get it to do things um and uh the thrill i mean i'm old enough to remember the sort of thrill of figuring things out through magazines and stuff like that i mean i wasn't a programmer when i was a kid but you know like there were things like that and mm-hmm. like the you know it might sound might sound crazy to people now that like wow you'd put in weeks of work to like load some software but the magic of when it worked uh was just the ultimate payoff um of actually having something go and like being able to make your own games and stuff like that and i I imagine who knows what things are going to be like 20 30 years from now but there are going to be a lot of people who are like the first time you know my parent got me a chat gpt account or something like that and they're like i could just make pictures by typing words and stuff like that so we're going through another little renaissance right now um so you studied studied computer science in university um and I was wondering a version version of a question that comes up a lot on here again, partly because of how people date themselves, is if you were starting out now, and having had the experience on you know both sides of the desks, as you say in your talks about you know you know being hired and hiring, would you get a formal computer science degree now if you wanted to have a career like you've had? Yes and no, because we really got to think about what a degree is for. A degree kind of gives you really three things. The first is that gives you early access to a professional network true you know the college career center that's there true all of the lectures and all the rest because who gives lectures in computer science programmers and whatnot right so they have access to an early network the other thing is kind of the prestige that goes with that an awful lot of jobs are out there have this blocker of minimum blocker is you got to have a, a hdip or you got to have a master's or whatever in order to be even consider for this job and given the way the market is right now that it is very much an employer's market they're looking for a way to filter people you know, you don't want to be filtered out just because you don't have a piece of paper, right? And then the last thing, of course, is for visa. So, I mean, if you want to go to the US or you want to come to Europe or whatever your plan is, 
you're not really going to be able to get a visa to get there without some kind of like formal education. So if you look at it through that lens, in terms of career opportunity, yeah, it's one of the best things you can do if you can afford it. Having said that, some of the best developers I know have no formal education. They just found a tutorial, found a magazine, found a book, start typing away. They made their, you know, cat social media page in the tutorial, later on turned it into a motorbike social media page, messing around, adding new things, and they just built their skills up bit by bit. So I think once you have the portfolio, it doesn't really matter how you got it, self-taught or college, but if you want those opportunities, a degree is the way forward. That's a that's a really great and, and balanced answer. I really like that. I mean, you know, um, uh, I've heard from people in the past who say, yeah, you know, there's and there's pre- like it's not it's, there's partly for uh, if you want to if you want to move abroad because often in order to get the visa to be just to be specific specific for anyone who hasn't come through this, typically the employer has to prove that only you can do this. Basically, right. it's, it's a bit it's a bit it's a bit fake, but like what it basically they have they have to justify hiring someone from outside their country rather than someone from inside their country. And having formal education and things to point to like that um, can really do the trick. There's other indus- there's industries like defense, for example, where often there's like it's very there's rules <laughs> that are applied now. But as you say, also you know, but once you're if you know that can help you get your foot in the door and stuff like that. But once you're very once you're accomplished, uh, those things don't start to matter. Don't matter so much anymore because then people can point to your accomplishments as the reason you're the you're the only person so there are these two sides to it and of course it also matters where you're from or where you want to go to university if you're going to if you're in canada where where i'm i am it's kind of moderately expensive in the united states it's it can just be really crazy prohibitive Um, yeah prohibitive yeah um uh so and you you mentioned it's an employer's market so when i was preparing for this interview i found a couple of your talks on youtube and there was one i think from last year and it was like what three three quarters of the way through the year you said like 200,000 jobs had been lost in tech or something like that just in 2023 alone there was like a quarter of a million jobs lost just through layoffs so never mind the normal people that you would have to compete with in terms of like all the fresh graduates and all the other job hoppers and all the rest in addition to that there's an extra quarter of a million people who were laid off so with that when you think of a market that's so saturated employers are trying to invent new ways to like filter out candidates. So like them seeing like extra technical tests that pop up, you're told three rounds in the beginning, you end up doing five or six, all this sort of things, right? Because there are so many people who apply just to kind of cut down to get to the cream of the crop, as it were, of who's available. And when we're talking about these job losses, I, I just imagine we're talking about sort of Europe and North America, probably. Um, most... Pretty much, yep. And why, why has that happened? It's a really good question. Um, I would say at the start of 2023, we've seen a couple of key companies just basically laying off staff as they do, you know, coming up to shareholder meetings, their annual meetings and all the rest their quarterlies. And that just kind of had a knock on effect because every other company said, well, if they're doing it, so can we, it's going to help our share price because that's ultimately what an awful lot of companies care about, right? And then as new technologies came in where we see, um, you know, generative AI actually being able to handle an awful lot of tasks. I think an awful lot of companies have maybe been unrealistically optimistic about what that can do for their companies and have laid off an awful lot of staff, but still trying to maintain the same output and they're using AI to do that. So it's a combination of things, right? Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, It's curious too, uh, the experience people can have. Uh, There's, you know, the kind of, one of the the sort of typical, I don't know, two paths in a wood differences is startup and big co. And if it's big co, yeah, things like share price, <laughs> there, there are people making decisions based on like headlines and stuff like that, which can be wild if you've come, if you've been on the other side of things where it's like, you know, developers are a profit center, not a cost center. <laughs> um, and working in those two different environments can be, can be very different. Yeah. And both, different. both of those environments are being affected for different reasons, mm-hmm. but they're all being hit at the same time. Wow. Okay. And, um, and it's interesting. One thing, uh, you know, to sort of like blend into talking about your book. Um, one thing, one thing you talk about that that I've I've talked to some people on the podcast a little bit about before um, is that you know when you're trying to sort of you know succeed as a software developer and sort of move up the ladder, particularly in companies uh, that maybe have a public share price and stuff like that, 
uh, being able to talk in business terms um, is very important. Absolutely. Some form of like business acumen, right? So, I mean, not just being able to understand like who we're building for. So like, why are we building this project for this particular person? What pain point are we trying to solve? I think there's also an aspect where there's an awful lot of developers and engineers who are kept very separate from the business side of things. Because when we look at like how an awful lot of software companies make money, it's kind of true, what, three avenues. The first is, is somebody going to pay us to build this or pay us for using it? Or does it put us in a place where it generates opportunity? So by having these new features or this whatever, will people be more attracted to pay us for our offering? Or can we reduce cost? So when you think of those three activities, as a developer, you kind of have to look at your actions through that lens. Otherwise, if you're just building things because someone's telling you to build things, maybe that doesn't really make sense. And as those developers move up the ladder, they're like, okay, we're going to build all these cool microservices, event-driven architecture, whatever. But it's like, okay, well, what? how are you helping the company with that? That might be the right thing to do, but do you understand from the business side of things how the cost affects us? Where's the long-term opportunity? What's the short-term investment we have? All of that fun stuff. Yeah, and it's, it's it can be it can be very um that kind of thing can be very kind of frustrating I think for for a certain kind of engineering mindset right where it's like well it'll be better that's why I'm proposing <laughs> I'm proposing to do this and they're like well there's 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 that that may be true but there like there's other things we could do with the time and resources that you're asking us to use so there's always there's always an argument that you need to make or usually always a trade off trade off doesn't have to be an argument right but it does have to be a trade off yeah yeah. yeah. Yeah, I meant argument in the sort of uh, spirit of you know trying to come up with the best explanation or what have you, not not uh, fight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Um, and uh, and yeah, it can be it can be curious too. You know, there can be in particular certain kinds of environments where maybe there's a sales team and stuff like that. They might be like, well, we were in the meeting and we promised them this feature, uh, so you know, you've got two weeks. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I've been there. That's not fun. No, no, no. But I, I mean, I mean, maybe I'm trying to lead into the book with, with the mm. conversation. That's part of what I talk about. And especially when I, I talk about senior devs, a big part of the role is not accepting things of face value. So, I mean, obviously the mm. business acumen is a part of it, but also when you get a requirement from a sales team, a stakeholder, the CEO, whatever, it's kind of your job to challenge that requirement to really interrogate it, bring it to Guantanamo Bay. Like, why are we doing this? How does this help the customer? Is this even realistic? Because what they've asked for might sound great on paper, but then when you actually sit down to like, do the system architecture and figure out how this works and all the rest, you might say, this doesn't make any sense to build this. Maybe another company has already built it and we're like, we can just use their AI, build a wrapper around it and we're done. You know what I mean? So there, there's always these kind of considerations where maybe we don't have to build it, we can use someone else's, maybe we just don't build it in general. We just don't fulfill this request because where's the business value or where's the value for us as a platform or as a team to invest in this? What do we, is this our, is this like our core competency? Does this fit with the domain that we usually work in? Are we going to have to maintain this forever? You know, how does this work for us? That's very, that, so that leads me to ask a question that I hopefully will be helpful to anyone listening to this who's sort of like, you know, a junior developer and wants to become a senior developer. Um, probably you don't want to do that on day one, uh, if, you, <laughs> if you're a junior, but I, right. so my, my question is, how do you, how do you build up to the point where you can be in a meeting and say someone maybe quite senior in management, not on the engineering side can be coming up with a requirement and it might be because they heard about it you know, at business school, it might be because they heard about it at a dinner party. It might be because a competitor just launched a similar feature and now they want it too. How do you build up the credibility or reputation to be able to then for the first time object to something that someone's proposing? Well, I mean, there's, there's a couple of aspects to that. The first, as you said, is build up the credibility. So having the social credit to be able to do that. And that's obviously true. The way you compose yourself in meetings, the way you do things in general that people look at you and say, hey, this is a reasonably level-headed person rather than this is some maniac who just criticizes everything we do, right? So <laughs> you got to have some kind of level-headedness about you. But there's also aspects of you don't have to reject something in the moment. I mean, you can go away and think about it. We spec it out. We come back and say, hey, that's not feasible. With cooler heads, with cooler reasoning. Because if you're in a meeting and someone says, hey, we got to build this, someone else built it, we got to get ahead. 
they're all fiery in that meeting, right? And you're just fighting fire with fire and that doesn't really work. But I mean, how a junior could get experience in that is, the first is when you're on a development team, ask to be part of any product meetings. So if there's a client meeting or if there's something like, hey, can I sit in on that? Or say to your boss, hey, I see there's a meeting. If I can't sit in, maybe tell me afterwards what was agreed, what you guys talked about. But show an interest in that side of things and start building up that kind of heuristics that you would have yourself of like, hey, we built this for them before. This seems to tie in with you know previous actions. Or hey, we've never built this before. Our competencies within the team don't match this. Maybe it's not a good idea we do that. When you have those kind of like reservations and those heuristics you're building up, obviously you don't bring that directly to the CEO the next time there's a meeting, but like bring it to your boss, bring it to the seniors. Hey, I was thinking about this. I just want you guys to confirm for me. And they'll be like, oh yeah, we were thinking that too. Or you know what? That's not really the way we do things here. But there's there's conversations and maybe not at the high, high level as, as what happens later on, but certainly at a more local level, you can have those conversations and get the feedback on them in a safe way. That's uh, uh, strikes me as extremely good advice. Um, uh, it, it resonates with something that I learned um, at a certain point. I, I brought the opportunity to go to a big name university and I was just so excited, not, not to, for the big name, but because of the people that were there. Um, and I, one thing I learned <clears throat> was you can just show up at lectures. You don't have to be in the class. Um, just show up and being able to just sit and listen to people at a high level in whatever they're doing, uh, you learn incredible amounts, not just about the subject, but about the way people interact. And so, for example, what you said about like learning that in maybe in the moment, if I've got an objection, I could air it right now, but you know what? Now isn't the moment to do that. Come back later with proof. <laughs> Uh, you know, that, that, that what you, well, you already know it, but you need to convince someone else. And when you've seen the convincing happening, uh, that can be really good. Um, one thing, uh, a, a common thing that people do when they're trying to sort of manage a career is get a mentor. Um, is that something that you've done or that you would recommend people do? And this specifically can mean reaching out to someone, even if you've never met them, that's probably not such a good idea, but reaching out to someone who is senior that you genuinely do admire and just asking them like straight up, like I need a mentor. Is that something you've done or you would recommend doing? I don't know. That's not something I've done. I couldn't really speak to that. But when we talk about mentorship and all the rest, I mean, you find people with experience where you work and where you are and build, build a network with them, build a connection. You know what I mean? Like people see all these like gurus on, on Instagram and LinkedIn and they're like, you know, uh, I do calls for 50 euros an hour, I'll mentor you, we'll do weekly coaching or whatever. Maybe that's fine. But maybe there's somebody a little bit closer to home that you can like just talk to. Be like, hey, I know there's a senior in another team. We're in the same department, but they handle something else. You know, I'll go for a coffee with them or at the next social night, I'll buy them a beer and just ask them, hey, what do you do? How does that work? And then once you kind of build up that little bit of a connection, then you can kind of say like, hey, I'm, I'm actually doing something that sounds like something you did before. You know, can I walk you through that or can I get you to sit in on a meeting or something like that, right? So you're you're building that connection rather than specifically saying like, hey, give me your knowledge, be my mentor, you know, be their friend, be an acquaintance, be a teammate. And, you know, both of you learn to better, blah, 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 blah. both of you kind of gain together in that sense, right? Uh, and yeah, and so um, that I guess that leads me to ask, so if I'd just done that with you, and I was like, hey, Philip, you know, I'm, I'm a junior guy in your company. I learned about you. I saw your talk online or something like that. Can we go for a coffee? And I asked you, what's the number one characteristic of a successful senior developer? What would you, what would you tell me? The number one, Jesus. Um, well, we said business acumen. That's one. Right. I, probably the best way to answer this is I, I interview an awful lot for like senior devs and, and all the rest. And my favorite interview question to ask is, when is the last time you changed your mind? And I think, I think that's something when we look at senior developers of people who are open to new ideas, that they're open to, hey, I was wrong. Somebody showed me some evidence and now I formed a new opinion. I'm open to that. That doesn't mean I can't form my own opinions. I can't have strong opinions, but I'm open to the discussion process and for a change to happen from that if that's required. So when we, when we look at junior developers, we want to upskill them. It's like, be open to new things. Be, be have your brain open to accept maybe things that you wouldn't have accepted before or to judge different people's opinions on 
form your own, you know? And um, for people who are, you know, really, really just starting out, maybe they're, they're, they're going to their first interview. Um, I guess, I guess, uh, here's something very specific that I always like to ask. Um, how should you dress nowadays? Dress as formal and comfortable as you feel yourself. There's an awful lot of people who put on like a three-piece suit and a tie, and that's not them. They don't feel comfortable. That's not right for them. I would rather see somebody like an Apollo and that they're, they're their best in terms of comfort rather than somebody who's like showing up in like super formal outfit, right? Don't know if that makes sense. Yeah, no, no, that, that totally makes sense. Um, uh, it reminds me of a, a cousin of mine got a job as an accountant years ago and he, he showed up in a tie and it was a sort of small... Canadian accounting firm uh, in winter, you know, and and uh, so everybody else was just wearing sweaters and and jeans basically. And at the end of the interview, he he did find they were going to hire him, but someone kind of just to sort of put a little bit of pressure on him said, uh, "Hey Tony, uh, throughout this whole interview, we've just been sitting here comfortably in our sweaters and jeans, and you've been there in this like suit with a tie on, you know, how do you feel about that?" And he goes, he leans forward and he taps his finger on the desks and he goes, "I wore this suit and this tie because I want this job." If it makes you feel uncomfortable, I can take the tie off. Mm -hmm. um, and then they all laughed and had a great time. But <laughs> um, the important thing I like about that story is like you, he was very comfortable doing what he was doing, even though it didn't match what everyone else is doing. And that you did express it so well there that like, whatever it is you do, you have to, you kind of, to some degree have to be yourself. Um, uh, and otherwise you kind of don't want the job probably anyway. And one, one thing you talk about in one of your talks that I saw online is like, um, employers don't stop looking at you just because they've hired you. Um, they're going to keep, they're going to keep looking at you for the first few months. And if they're battle hardened, they're going to be looking at how you change over the first couple of months that you're there. Exactly. So when you think of interviewing, everybody's on their best behavior, right? Everybody's clean shaved or hair's fresh. They're like super polite, super nice and all the rest. But maybe like with an awful lot of relationships, right? They're like the first couple of months are great. And then after that, the old habits kick in and then we kind of forget to be the persona and we go back to being ourselves, you know? And that's obviously why an awful lot of companies have like probation periods to evaluate your progression and like, are you great the first few weeks and then you kind of like peter off or are you still learning and you're adapting with the team and all the rest? So it is a case of like, at the start, there is always a little bit of like acting and masquerading, but as time goes on, you become comfortable, the team becomes comfortable you gel together and then you don't have to wear that mask. You can just be you and fit in. And that's like the best one that happens, right? Um, and, uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna keep asking you for all of your pearls of wisdom because everyone should buy your book, um, <laughs> uh, which has, which has a lot more in it. Uh, but one, one thing I did want to ask you about is, is remote work. Um, and do you have, for anyone who's sort of like maybe, you know, the only people they've had to go to for advice all spent their careers in offices and stuff like that. So again, for someone who's really just starting out when like even a little bit of advice can be, be a huge advantage or help. Like, let's say someone's just got their, they landed their first job. Oh my God, but they're, they're remote. What should their setup be like? How should they act in calls? Good question. I mean, how they should act. I mean, however they're comfortable. If they feel putting on like a professional facade at the start helps them feel like they're part of something. Cause I mean like imposter syndrome is a real thing. So, I mean, like if you feel like maybe a bit of an act and that helps you feel a bit more at ease, I mean, go for that. Right. That's fine. What I would say is remote isn't for everybody. Maybe that's mm -hmm. like a, the most polarizing opinion about it. Cause people are like remote's better. Home's better. It's not for everybody. Some people work way better in an office environment. Some people work better in hybrid. Some people work better in remote. So it's really what works best for you. If you're at home and you kind of hate that because you're at home 24 hours a day, find a co-working place, work from there. There's a lot of free ones, maybe a library or whatever, cafe. I know at my office, we meet up once a month, sorry, once a week, you know, the other four days we're at home. And then one day a week we go in, make sure to see what the other person looks like. If we remember them, we've lunch together and all the fun stuff, but that's what works for us in our situation. So I'd say if you're new and someone says, Hey, remote's the future, we're all doing it and it's not gelling for you, well, maybe that's not for you and that's fine. You know, you can try work at something else or find another job that suits your situation a little bit better. Um, one of the uh, common 
pieces of advice given to sort of young developers who are looking for a you know a, a career is to um, sort of start a side project or something like that, have it up on GitHub, make it you know public and things like that. But another thing you can do is write books, um, and you've you've written a couple. Um, and so the last question I often like to ask, or well, the second last question I often like to ask people on the podcast is. Um, What's your approach to writing? I mean, you know, so you, you know, writing a book, become a senior software developer. Did you like test out a ton of different titles beforehand? Did you come up with a full outline? Did you set aside a weekend to write things like that? Or was it, you know, what, just what was your approach to, to getting it done? Yeah, with this specific book, it's kind of funny. I, I put out a, a podcast episode two years ago, which I'm going to go on a tangent, so I'm sorry. I put out a podcast episode two years ago, which was what makes a senior developer and part of that, we talked a little bit about just like title inflation and funny things, but then also talked about some skills that a developer, a senior developer would have in terms of things like business acumen, challenging requirements, mentoring juniors, all that fun stuff. And I put that out two years ago, just as like a something quickly I put together. And over the last two years, I have had a steady stream of people emailing me going, hey man, I listened to your episode and I used the advice and I got promoted. Or I was able to jump ship from a mid-level role and start somewhere else as a senior. It's like, okay, that's kind of cool. I feel really good about that. Good for you. And I've got loads of them. So over the last two years, I kind of reached out and was like, well, what else did you do? How did you help? Like, how did it help you? What other things have you seen? And then through my work, as I said, I interview a load of seniors and I train them. I work with them all the time. So I just kind of take notes as I'm going. And it was a case. I was like, okay, there's something here. People are interested in this. I'm going to collate all of my notes together, try and figure out what an outline looks like from that, and then expand it out. And that's kind of what led to the book. Oh, that's really great. I mean, that's always the, the best to hear when sort of people people pulled it out of you uh, because something that you said that you said worked. Um, the last question I always like to ask, the actual last question I always like to ask if the guest is a LeanPub uh, author is, um, if while you were writing your book using LeanPub, if there was one thing that had you shaking your fist at Lean Pub, going, damn you, Lean Pub, this sucks, uh, that we could fix for you, or if there was one magic feature we could build for you, can you think of anything you would ask us to do? The only thing I'd say is live preview. So I'm really old school. I'm using the Markdown editor, right? Mm -hmm. And what I do is I actually write in Markdown and Visual Studio Code on my machine, and I've got a live preview to decide on that. And then when I'm kind of happy with that, I'll like copy all of that and then dump it into the, the web editor. But then I have to generate a version and then the version might look different because I've got the teaming stuff inside the the web app, right? Now, it's not so much a problem, it's just a minor niggle. But if I could see like a live preview at the time I'm writing with the team I've chosen, that would just be chef's kiss. Fantastic. Yeah, thank thank you very much for sharing that. We've we've had that that request a few times in the past. So for anyone listening, you know, when you when you when you when you're using LeanPub, you can just, you know, create an ebook however you want and upload the EPUB or PDF to LeanPub in our upload writing mode. But we also have our own writing modes where you write in. Markuo, which is our version of Markdown for books. Um, and yeah, in order to see what the PDF or the EPUB is actually going to look like, you write your text manuscript, but then you have to click a button to create a preview. And then you go through a bunch of steps and you get your files. A lot of people, particularly programmers, really like to see the text that they're typing on the left and what it's going to look like in the book on the right, right away. Um, we may have that someday, but it's, it's not, unfortunately it's not on the radar yet, but, um, yeah, for now, for now, you're going to have to click the button and wait. Um, fortunately, after a while, you know, you kind of know what things are going to look like and things like that. And it's only when you're using a new feature that you really need to be a little bit, is this really going to work? Um, but yeah, we've had that before and we'd, we'd love to have that, that chef's kiss uh, going someday and, and hopefully we will. Well, uh, Philip, thank you very much for taking some time out of your, your evening in Madrid uh, to talk to me and to talk to all of us. And thank you very much for using Wingpub as a platform for your uh, excellent books. I mean, thanks for putting it out there in the first place. I mean, the amount of people that you've helped with your career and enabled them to bring good information to people is fantastic. And thanks for having me. It's been fun. Thanks.